So I wore my red, white, and blue today in recognition of Memorial Day, but it is one of those rare years in which Pentecost Sunday, the birthday of the church, falls on Memorial Day weekend. And that is our emphasis today. And that's what we want to think about. Uh, Will Williman, in his commentary on the Pentecost story, in his commentary on the book of Acts, begins his reflections with a a statement, a line from the poet T.S. Eliot, in my beginning is my end. In my beginning is my end. The, The thought is there's something about beginning stories that foreshadows what lies ahead for a person or or an organization, whatever it happens to be. Have you ever thought about that in your life or the lives of other people, your own personal birth stories? Do you have any traditions like birthdays where you remember birth stories? In our family, we do this a lot of times when we're celebrating birthdays together. Our daughter, Julie, was born after a long and arduous delivery. Uh, It was a long day for Susan. And I thought, you know, that kind of reflects Julie. She takes her time and comes into the world facing it on her terms when she's good and well ready. So it it does kind of fit who Julie is. Now, our middle daughter, Sarah, is just the opposite. We walked in the hospital door and 30 minutes later, Susan was holding Sarah. Uh, Sarah is quick and decisive. She doesn't waste a lot of time. Now, our youngest, Anna, somewhere in between. She didn't have a long, arduous delivery, but, you know, it was deliberate, and that kind of fits Anna. She is a deliberate person, a careful decision maker, but when she makes up her mind, that's it. She doesn't waste any time looking back or second-guessing. Have you got any birth stories? I celebrated my 60th a couple of weeks ago, and uh, I would often remember with my family, my, my parents especially would remember for me, that I was born breech, back in first. So literally, in my beginning, was my end. <laughs> literally for me. And whenever I misbehaved growing up, whenever I misbehaved, which was quite often, my dad would remind me of this fact. Well, you came into this world showing your backside and you haven't quit yet. <laughs> So what are your birth stories? What stories do you have to share? A Pentecost is about the birthday of the church. When the disciples of Jesus were gathered together and the Holy Spirit came upon them in dramatic fashion, just like we heard about a moment ago, on the day of Pentecost. Pentecost was one of the three pilgrimage festivals in the Jewish faith. Penta, we probably recognize the prefix, 50 50 days after Passover. Jews, wherever they lived, those even beyond the borders of Israel, were encouraged to make pilgrimage back to the temple to celebrate the festival of first fruits, the harvest beginning to come in, giving thanks for the God who provides for us. And this is why there were so many different nationalities in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost when the Spirit empowered the disciples to become the church. And that's what I want us to think about today, the meaning of this, because what Pentecost means is that you and I have the same spiritual ancestry. We all have the same spiritual birth story. And what the writer of Acts would want to do is to teach us something in this birth story. Really, the Bible does it throughout Scripture. Exodus takes a little bit of time to tell about the birth story of Moses, who was spared death by Pharaoh and was delivered, sending Moses down by his mother in a basket of reeds so that his life would be spared. He was delivered, and guess what? He became a deliverer. The writer of Luke tells about Jesus' birth with great elaborate detail, born homeless in a manger to say that this is a Savior who will relate to those who are outcast and on the underside of life. So what does the birthday of the church have to say to you and me? What does it teach us? Let's consider a few things about our birth story in the church to see what it has to say about our own story as the church and being the church today. 
It begins when the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. Now, what was that place? It says they were in an upper room. Some scholars believe it could have been the same upper room where they celebrated the Last Supper. Today in Jerusalem, there is a place called the Cynical that commemorates the upper room. And when Christian pilgrims go there, they typically remember one of two things. The Last Supper, they have a very quiet, somber, holy communion service, or they remember Pentecost. More Pentecostal-type Christians like focusing on Pentecost and the spectacular display of the Holy Spirit's presence. Ten years ago... I was in Jerusalem filming a DVD resource for a book I wrote called The God We Can Know. And we were in the upper room filming part of it. There were different groups of Christians and corners of the room having communion. It was quiet. We were still able to record. And then we became aware of a group of Christians from South America. They were praying. They were singing. It was soft and beautiful. But then they started getting louder and louder and and they stood up and they began shouting out and speaking in tongues and falling on the well I had a film crew from Israel doing the filming and it was clear we couldn't go on like like we were just going to have to take a break for a while so the videographer set his bag down he pulls out a water bottle pulls out something to eat he's just watching this he says Rob do all churches in America worship this way does your church worship this way? I said, well, not exactly. At St. Luke's in Indianapolis, we do this on the second Sunday of the month, not every Sunday, (laughs) just the second Sunday of the month. This has nothing to do with today's sermon. Anytime I hear the Pentecost story, it takes me back to that moment. So, you know, I just shared a memory lane with you. All right, what was I talking about? What, what were the disciples doing in that one place where they were together in the upper room we learn that from chapter one they all joined together constantly in prayer there's an important element of the birth story right there that the church should and needs to be engaged in prayer 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 is essentially an act of surrender of giving up and recognizing we are dependent on God we are hopeless without God's help we need God's presence and when we pray we are turning to God saying Lord we need you be ever present with us. What does that look like in your life? To have patterns of prayer before you jump into the problem solving, where you pause for a moment and say, God, this problem's too big. We got to start with you. Last Sunday afternoon, I joined some of our advocates for peace in a prayer for peace service at New Era Church on 30th Avenue. Uh, Dr. Clarence Moore is the senior pastor there. It was for all churches in the city to come together. And it was about the gun violence that has just been wrecking our city. Now, just two weeks ago, we had the 21-year-old son of one of our staff members, Tijuana Lockhart, who was shot and killed in what appears to be a random event in downtown Indianapolis. So I felt a strong need to be at this service. First thing that Dr. Moore did was divide everybody up randomly into groups of seven and ask us to spend the next hour praying together uh, for different petitions of peace in the city. Now, my activistic side wanted to say, this is nice, but what we really need to be doing is to get outside and get out there and develop strategies that are going to change our city. (laughs) But my wiser self, my more spiritual self, knew that this was exactly where we need to be calling together Christians of different races, different denominations, 
Christians, that if we got into enough of a conversation about worship styles, about how our faith addresses political issues, uh, about our theologies, we would have easily started separating and dividing. But when we said, we've all got a problem. No one is spared from this problem. We have got to have God's help. Let's pray. It was a little Pentecost experience for me realizing as I just looked around the room at different moments, this this is the church at its best because we find that it not only brings us together and helps us develop humility, many times we find that when we pray, we become more aware and noticeable of what God is doing. Adam Hamilton in one of his books tells how just a couple of years ago their church took Christmas baskets to all of their members who were unemployed. And when they would take them to folks, they would say, look, this is just a little way of us wanting you to know you are not forgotten. God loves you and is with you. So Adam shared in this himself. He had his desk full of baskets one Sunday after the last service, and he was going to use his Sunday afternoon to deliver the baskets. He called the first name on his list, a woman in the church, and he said, hi, this is Adam Hamilton. I'm senior pastor of Church of the Resurrection, and I want to bring a basket to you. And he explained why, and the woman fell apart on the phone, just started bawling. And when she got some composure, this is what she said to Adam. I was so discouraged this morning, I couldn't bring myself to come to church. I watched online, and as the service ended, I wrote a prayer I had just finished writing this prayer, asking for God to show me he still loved me and to wrap his arms around me. And then the phone rang, and I heard your voice, and you said, we just want you to know you're not forgotten and God loves you. I was speechless. I've never had a prayer answered so quickly. (laughs) It is amazing. When we start praying intentionally, regularly, fervently, we just become more open and aware of what God is doing already so I want to give you an assignment and I hope you'll either take a picture with your phone of these questions on the screen I'm going to give you in a moment or write them down real quick I want to encourage you to take some time to pray very deliberately maybe write out your prayer today this week and these are some questions I might offer if it would help you in considering the prayer that you would write The first question is, what do I need? What do I need? Write that out. Express it to God. What are you needing in your life right now? Another question, what does our world need? What does our world need? And one last question, what does God need from me? What does God need from me? I just wonder if we wrote a prayer out that addresses those thoughts, what we might start to see and experience ourselves as we look around and become aware of what God is doing around us all the time. So the church was gathered in prayer. But then look what else we learned from our birth story. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven And all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit. The result of their prayer is that the Holy Spirit came. Now, we don't spend as much time as we should talking about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit simply means that part of God that empowers us to do the work of Jesus. That part of God that empowers us to do the work of Jesus. Every Sunday morning at about 6.30 or 7 a.m., I get a text from my friend uh, Dwayne Anders, who's pastor of the Cathedral of the Rockies United Methodist Church in Boise. We're part of a group of pastors around the country, and we meet a couple of times a year. And every Sunday, Dwayne sends all of us a prayer or a quote by somebody that just helps us with this day. This is what he sent this morning. Preacher Henry Nowen said, without Pentecost, the church event, or the Christ event, sorry, without Pentecost, the Christ event, 
the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus remains imprisoned in history as something to remember, think about, and reflect on. The Spirit of Jesus comes to dwell within us so that we can become living Christ here and now. That's, that's what the Pentecost story means for us, is that God meets us as we look to God in dependence and gives us the ability to act and carry on the work of Jesus. There's an old saying that says, pray as if everything depends on God, but act as if everything depends on you. This, of course, assumes that we're willing to act because the Holy Spirit comes upon those who don't just say good words, but they are willing to offer their life to be used. Think about what this meant for the disciples. God empowered them to speak in languages they did not know. God gave them ability that was beyond their ability because they were willing to be used. The Holy Spirit is like electricity. If you ever watch folks who work for the power company and they're called to deal with the situation where there is a down line, what kind of boots do they wear? Rubber-soled boots. Why? Because rubber acts as an insulator for electricity. Rubber will stop the flow of electricity. Why? Because electricity enters into that which it can pass through, not just stay there. The Holy Spirit enters that which it can pass through. So we've got to be willing to be used. Have any of you ever Googled your family name to see if there's anyone famous in your past? You know, there are not a lot of Fuquays around. So I found it real interesting a few years ago to learn that there is a Bill Fuquay who was kind of famous. He set a Guinness Book of World Records for remaining motionless. You see, I mean, there might be a little similarity in this picture up here. It's kind of scary. This man stood motionless for over 16 hours. Now, 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 uh, he doesn't have a Y on the end of his name. He is a Fuquay without the wine. I'm kind of glad because I'm hoping it's not my family. I don't know. I don't know that I want my claim to fame to be that I did nothing. (laughs) Too many churches, too many churches have as a claim to fame being motionless. Or to quote Leighton Ford, they've developed the fine art of doing nothing. They worship They have pitch-in meals where they enjoy each other's company, but not a lot more. They're not addressing the problems of the world. They're not talking about racism. They're not rolling up their sleeves to say, what have we got to do to help the poor? How do we welcome other people who are not a part of our closed circle into our fellowship? And you know what? That's why I'm so thankful to serve St. Luke's. Because St. Luke's is a church willing to talk about the divisive topics of our day to say, what does it have to do with our Christian faith? St. Luke's is a church willing to say, let's welcome all people, especially those other churches might not welcome the same. People of all sexual identities, let's let people know they have a place here. Let's be willing to roll up our sleeves and get hands on with matters of poverty. Now, I know, I know, we might not always agree on the stands that we take as a church, but I sure hope we could all feel proud of the fact that we're part of a church that doesn't do nothing. We're part of a church that doesn't claim how long can we go motionless. We're a church that says the only way we stay alive is when we let the Holy Spirit empower us and use us. So a church in prayer, a church that is empowered by the Holy Spirit, and then one last and very important piece of our birth story we can take away 
And that is verse 11, where the people who heard this commotion going on went up to witness what the disciples were doing. And it says, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. In other words, the church brought unity to the diversity. You know, I, I, I think we live in a world that is starting to get an adrenaline rush out of division. People who enjoy watching news shows for the debates and the people who agree with their position to see if they can put somebody else in their place, to see if they can out-argue them and maybe even embarrass them in the process. I wonder if we know how to bring unity in our world. One thing I know for sure is that God does. Paul said in Corinthians, for God is not a God of disorder, but of peace. God builds bridges, not dams. God spanned the chasm of the universe to come and be with us. The word Emmanuel, God with us. I believe God takes delight when the church is willing to be with other people. Again, think about the Pentecost story. The disciples were empowered to speak in all of the different languages of the people represented in the city. You would think that God would make it a lot simpler. Empower all of the people who were there to be able to speak and understand the one same language. Just get everybody talking The same language, that's what we need. But what was God doing on Pentecost? God was correcting the curse of the Tower of Babel. You gotta go all the way back to Genesis 11 to know what that's about. Early in the civilization of the world, all of the peoples who felt vulnerable to the forces of nature came together to say, let's build a tower that reaches up into the heavens. Let's all speak the same language so that we can be our own gods, so that we can be secure. And the Bible says that God scattered them so that they did not speak the same language anymore. God confused their languages, not because God takes delight in division, but God wants people willing to depend on God. And so the Pentecost story comes much later in the Bible to say that this is God's will, to teach us not how we all need to get on the same page and speak the same words, but God empowers a few people called the church to show that they understand other people. They are willing to speak their language. They are letting folks know that they are identified and they're welcomed. What does that look like for a church? to welcome people of all races, to welcome them in, but not say, now, we want you to learn our way. We want you to learn our custom, our culture. No, 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 a church that says, bring your culture with you. Bring your customs with you. Because you, all of you, is respected. What about a church that says to people of different sexual identities, You are welcome, but you don't have to hide. You don't have to pretend. We want you to come and be who God made you to be because we believe God wants you to have a place here. What about people who know nothing about the faith, who don't know the Bible, who don't know the traditions of the church, who don't know the hymns? To say you don't have to. You are welcome for who you are. You're given a place here. We want you to feel heard. We want you to feel seen. We want you to feel noticed. When we notice people and we learn enough about them to understand where they're coming from so that we can speak their language, 
we're being a church that brings people together, which is God's great goal. I told not long ago a story from traveling with Carver McGriff uh, to Normandy, which he was leading every year. Back in October 2021, Susan and I finally got to go on this trip for the last Carver Marianne McGriff Normandy tour. For those who've been on the trip, you know that toward the end of the trip, Carver takes everyone to the American Cemetery in Normandy. This magnificent scene of, uh, of white grave markers, polished stone, where uh, over 9,000 soldiers who were a part of the Normandy invasion were killed in World War II. We have time to walk around, to read names. Some people have relatives they want to go and look for. And after a time, we gather for a worship service. And it's so meaningful. And it always feels like, what a perfect ending to our trip. But then Carver, being Carver, always has one more thing for you. You get in the bus, and then he takes you to the German cemetery. And in the German cemetery, he says, now walk around and read the names on these gravestones. But don't read them with a narrative of history that says all Germans were Nazis. All Germans were bad. Remember that a good many German soldiers died serving a cause they did not believe in, but they had no choice in. He said, so as you walk around, find just one name and pause and say a prayer for that family, a family of a son who didn't come home, a son who never got to have a family. Pray for them and what they have become through the years. And you get back on the bus a little quieter, thinking, yeah, this is what we need. We need to live with bigger, wider narratives of our world. And a narrative, I believe, looks like our birth story of a God who is always at work to bring humanity together. So let us continue to live out our birth story so that in our beginning will most definitely be our end. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit.